If you'll turn in your Bible with me this morning, our scripture passage for the day is 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21. If you don't have your Bible, a good portion of this passage is on the yellow sheet inside your bulletin. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him each of us might become the righteousness of God. We have before us this morning a marvelous text from the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church at Corinth in his second letter to them in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and you may well have recognized this text today because it includes not only uh, the text for the month of October, our theme verses for this month, but also uh, the text that was read for us includes uh, the theme that we had back in April. And uh, on the back of the prayer bulletin, as Anson has pointed out, I have both of those texts, the April text and the uh, October text before us or before you, uh, on, on the insert, and uh, so not, not every verse that Anson read was there, but uh, the two texts that we've been focusing on uh, are, uh, that are there. Uh, these texts, why these texts? Uh, of course, this is a, a very rich passage of Scripture, and we could focus our attention at a couple of different places uh, in this reading, Uh, But these two texts, the one from April and now this one from October, are texts that were significant to uh, our uh, four parents in the 16th century. And uh, over and over again in the writings of the radical wing of the Reformation, uh, there are references to 2 Corinthians 5 and many, many references, probably the majority of references in in this chapter to verse 17 from April's text, but also from verse 20 here in this text uh, that we've read for us this morning. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ. What what an interesting and... uh, Uh, not only interesting, but perhaps a responsibility that we have. Uh, We don't like words so much like responsibility, but it's an invitation. This is an invitation for the people of God to be part of what God is doing in the world. Now, we want to be clear that we are not the reconciliation that God uh, gives to the world, but we are are bearers of that message. The reconciler is Jesus Christ, as Paul makes clear here. Uh, He says that it is in Christ that God was reconciling the world to himself in verse 19, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message 
of reconciliation to us. Entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Well, think about that for a minute. We have an opportunity to talk or share testimony about how we've been reconciled. The scriptures is the story. The scripture book is the story of God's attempt to reconcile the world to himself. We know we, we went back, we studied um, a whole year through the scriptures and we started in Genesis and we recognize that in Genesis chapter 3 there's a falling out. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a falling away from God so that we're out of relationship, humankind, out of relationship with God. The rest of the story we know is God's attempt to reconcile the world, reconcile his creation to himself. And the ultimate gift in that uh, story, of course, is Jesus Christ, as Paul underscores here for us. Um, my uh, Greek teacher uh, has also uh, authored uh, a commentary in the uh, New Believers commentary series on the book of 2 Corinthians, George Shillington. And in his commentary, he says this, and I found it so enriching, I wanted to share it with you. Paul's Christian conviction shines through with the brilliance of the North Star on a clear night. God has acted in Christ to recreate the world and restore humankind to a right relationship with the divine mind. This is a, a rich passage of scripture and uh, some, as here, this author, thinking of this as the North Star, giving some direction, some focus, some attention. Paul's fears, a fear of the Lord uh, drove his ministry and his message. Now, we may kind of react to uh, that, but if you notice in verse 11, he says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, now, we, we want, we're much more comfortable uh, talking about the, the love of God, not, uh, not being in fear of God. But Paul makes it clear in this text that it's the fear of God that moves us into considering how we can be reconciled to God. And he talks very seriously about this. It's the magnitude of Christ's love in this passage uh, that comes to the fore, not, not so much the fear, but the fear of God is important and it's significant to be in awe, in respect, to have consideration for the greatest power of the universe, the creator, the Lord of the universe. This moves us. Now, evil people, people who are out of connection with God and don't care about God, don't have that fear of God. But believers have a fear of God, and with that fear of God, they move into relationship to be reconciled with God, so they no longer have to fear God. So it's not a matter of scaring people into the kingdom when we talk about fear of God. It is the respect, the honor, the uh, interesting place that we give to God that moves us so that we can be reconciled to God because he's provided the reconciliation. Uh, Paul's reminder of God's judgment was not so much an attempt to scare us. Unbelievers, as I've said, do not fear God. Only believers who have already experienced God's presence fear losing it. And so the fear of God preached as an essential part of the gospel, is the gracious gift of God to keep his people persevering. It's important for us to remember, to recognize, that neither the righteousness of God nor the sinful conditions of the world have changed since Paul's day. Now, we've had lots of history, had lots of opportunity for people who have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ to give witness, to give testimony of that, to bear fruit of that, to give evidence of it, so that we should have a better understanding of it. But the conditions, and we look around our world, and 
And you know, like our president who said this week, we have to do this again. We have to talk about another massacre. When will it end? We see that's the kind of world we live in, an unreconciled world to God. So people seek to take vengeance, seeks to take power into their own hands, use, use things that have been created for good, for evil, and destroy relationships because they haven't been reconciled to God. The shooter had no fear of God. If he had a fear of God, he'd want to move into reconciliation with God. So, those who fear God's judgment repent of their sin and receive this gift of reconciliation that Paul is talking about here in our text today. But as there are many places we could make emphasis, my emphasis today is not so much on that gift. We often talk about the gift that comes and we should never undermine that gift. But the amazing thing in the apostles' letter to the believers at Corinth is to say, you've received that gift. You are ambassadors of that gift. God has chosen you to be ambassadors of this gift. He's invited us to declare our confidence, our trust in this gift. Wow. Lost in much of the activity of this past summer, lost in all of the work of delegates to Kansas City, all of the work of the Executive Council of the Mennonite Church USA, I think, lost all of that, was a pastoral letter that the executive sent out, including a number of things, but in that letter, way back in the springtime, they said they're announcing a commitment to make evangelism and church revitalization an urgent priority and envisioned our Mennonite church as a thriving evangelistic and missional church that births new congregations and ministries across the country and around the world. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that kind of lost in all of our conversation and about other issues. We had five other issues that we spent a lot of time as delegates on the floor, but we didn't talk about this. And let me tell you, this is, this is a grand vision. It's important, but it's very costly. It's costly work to be outwardly focused, to be engaged in evangelism, and be missional in the church. Planting churches is very, very difficult work. I've been there, I know a little bit about it, just a little bit. But I know it takes a tremendous amount, not only of of work by individuals, but as the body of Christ has to come together with a lot of work. As Linda was talking about in the illustration this morning, it takes more than one thread to plant a church. Now, a church with 200 years of history, or almost 200 years of history, may not think a whole lot about church planning. See, what happens to us and I've been in both places. I've, I've spent 15 years in church planting. I've spent 15, 20 years now in established congregations with more than 100 years of history. And, and so I, I've seen things from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, when we have a lot of history, when we're established, we often become focused on preserving ourselves. And we give very little time and attention to that evangelistic push or the church planting push because we hold on to the resources for ourselves. Now, I'm not talking about Oak Grove. You know, I've only been here a few years and I would not try to assess the history. But in my own home congregation, church that loved me from, I was going to say when I was a little boy, I never was a little boy. I was so excited one time when we went shopping, I got my first new pair of blue jeans. See, I had older brothers, always had hand-me-downs. Did I tell you this story? Always had hand-me-downs. Went to the store, bought my first pair of blue jeans, had a great big ticker, t- ticker on it, a ticket on it, and said, Husky. <laughs> and I was so proud of, oh my, craziness. Husky. I was never little. But I, in this church that nurtured me as a little child, my parents were part of the 
the founding of this church. My dad was on the first building committee. This church nurtured me, the youth group that helped to identify the gifts, encouraged me to consider going into ministry. This church, when I went to help plant a church for that congregation, controlled very, very tightly the financial resources because they had stuff going on in their church. I mean, my church, my home church. But we were very needy as a young church plant. And I could give you a whole story of the kind of resources, the secondary... uh, Maybe we need to shut this off. No, forget that. I'm just telling you, it's very, very difficult to be highly committed. I'm talking from experience about being highly committed to planting churches and being on the front line of bringing people into the church and helping the church to grow so that the church can be extended. It's very, very easy. Now, you may not not agree with this, and as being part of this church community as pastor now, I recognize it's not easy preserving what we've got either. It's difficult. It's a challenge. Culture is shifting. Community looks different than it did 100 years ago. Resources are different. I understand it's very challenging. So when the denomination says we are envisioning uh, outreach and growth and church planting and a missional missional uh, outlook, I'm saying "Ah, that's a great ideal. But it is rooted in this text of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul says, but you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are to be ones who are reconcilers in the world and bear this message, give testimony to this message. It's not just some uh, nebulous idea. It doesn't happen by just a nebulous idea out there. It doesn't just happen by certain leadership people. If you're counting on the pastor to do it, it's probably not going to happen. You see, it needs to be God's people moving with this. We need to be the ambassadors. It's our opportunity, our privilege, our responsibility to give testimony to what God has done for us about this gift of reconciliation that Jesus Christ is for the world, to reconcile the world to himself. And don't we need it in our world? I mean, I just talked about the events of this week, and as the president has said it again and again and again, it just keeps happening. We need reconciliation. And so I'm looking back into our history. And you know, I've studied our church history, not as deeply as some others, many in this church that have studied it. You know the stories. I was struck that we don't, I didn't, at least in my studies, never talked a whole lot about the martyr synod of, in Augsburg, uh, Germany of 1527. In August of that year, 60 church leaders gathered together. And what did they do? They mapped out a strategy of evangelism for all of Europe. Interesting. Many of us, we don't talk about that evangelistic perspective and spirit of our founding fathers and mothers, both. I'll illustrate that in a moment. I grew up talking a lot about the Schleitheim Confession. I mean, six months earlier in February of 1527 in Schleitheim, uh, there was a gathering of church leaders there, and they talked about theology, and they talked about the church, and they talked about things of hammering out theology, but they did not talk about evangelism. Six months later, in August, there was a gathering in Augsburg. Augsburg, 1527. Sixty leaders get together. Now, why it's referred to as the Martyr Synod is that within five years, within five years, 57 of those 60 were dead. They were martyred. They were killed. Not, not, they didn't just die because of sickness. They, they were killed because of their faith. They were drowned in a river, burned at a stake. They suffered in prison. They died. They were martyred to the faith. Within five years, there were only three of them living. That's why it's called the Martyr Synod. My point is, is that it was a strategy of evangelism to share the good news, to be ambassadors of Christ all across Europe. And they did. They went everywhere in that short period of time. Short period of time giving witness to their faith. It wasn't just something that they thought was a nice thing. 
It wasn't just an ethical belief or a theological uh, description. It wasn't just something that they hammered out and said, this is what we believe and doesn't that look good? No, it was something that was part and parcel of who they were. This is what God has done in our lives and we want to share it with you. They wanted to share the good news with other people. You see, all those leaders... All those leaders that gathered together were killed. And that's one of the amazing things about the movement was, is that it didn't kill the movement. Because there were people like, my church history professor from Conor Gribble College, Arnold Snyder, wrote a book. Oh, forget the title of it now. Profiles, Profiles of Anabaptist Women. In that book, he tells the story of Margaret Helpart. Margaret was, well, in those days, she was like a lot of women. And she had a lot of things to manage in her household. She spent a lot of time in her kitchen. But she also went to the marketplace every day. And when she went to the marketplace, she talked to people. She gave a testimony. As a matter of fact, she testified to the activity of God in her life the reconciling work that God had done in her life to such an extent that people all over the town wanted to be part of Margaret's church. As a matter of fact, because of her witness and testimony, the local authorities felt very threatened. The local Lutheran church was very threatened because all of the people were leaving and joining this radical wing of the Reformation. And so they had to do something. So what did they do with Margaret? Well, there are many stories about what they did with others, but what they interestingly did with Margaret in this town, because they were humane people, they weren't going to put her to death, so they just tied her to her kitchen table. They went in there with a big chain, tied her up, tied her to the table, allowed her to do the work at the kitchen to feed her family, to make lunch and be there for the family, but preventing her from going downtown into the marketplace and sharing her faith. Now, the interesting thing is, is that Margaret probably was the first Houdini. She found ways to slip out of those chains and go to the marketplace anyway. And the authorities, they went down to the marketplace, found her sharing her faith, took her back, chained her up again. Dozens of times she was found in the marketplace after authorities had chained her to her kitchen. Now, I simply tell that story not so much because it was a Houdini at work. The Holy Spirit was obviously at work in Mark because she had a message of reconciliation that she had experienced that she was sharing with other people because she was an ambassador for Christ. You probably never heard of her before. Well, maybe some of you have read history. You've heard of her before. She wasn't made a pastor. She wasn't made one of the heroes of, of the Anabaptist radical wing of the Reformation because in that time and place, she was simply a woman. But my point is, that's it. She was simply a woman of faith, who became an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Each one of us, you say, I'm a nobody. <laughs> Margaret Helpmark was a nobody. Well, not a nobody. Don't, I'm not, you know what I mean? She didn't have a lot of resources. She didn't have a big name. She didn't have a lot of skills. She didn't have an education. She just shared what God had done for her. And that is our calling as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, one of the things that's circulating these days is a word that came out, I think it came out of Pittsburgh, as somebody's assessment of, of those of us in this tradition where we've come to. It says, oh, we love service. And we, we flirt with peace. And I think that's so true, and I, I need to confess. You know, the last, last week, we, two weeks ago, we focused our attention on Peace Sunday that we were recognizing across the church. And I, I preached a, if I say so myself, a wonderful sermon on that. Well, I'm just confessing to you, that's, that's the easy thing to do. It's easy to, to talk about it. It's easy to, to say this is, what a, this is what it's about. It's another thing to actually walk with our immigrant brothers and sisters it's actually another thing to actually walk with our black brothers and sisters. It's interesting. It's just another thing. If somebody said, um, I mentioned, used last week one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s quotes that the most segregated hour of America is Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. It's not just black and white. It's we're also segregated with the other people that we disagree with. And 
So, you know, we Mennonites, we're in our place. The Lutherans are in their place. The Catholics are in their place. And on 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, we don't come together. And I'm just confessing to you that it's easy to talk about, I'm guilty too, but we need to do more than that because what happens is we become great ethical thinkers and our faith may become something that we uh, have a statement about this, about racism, about immigration, about what we believe about this or that, our theology on peace or whatever it is our theology is, and we can still be people who don't live the reconciled life. We still don't live being at peace with God. We don't become ambassadors for that. It's kind of like the church people who, <laughs> on Easter Sunday morning, they sing the song of the, ref- of the resurrection, but they're not people who believe in a resurrection. I mean, they say they, they, you know, they talk about a faith that they've inherited, they've received, but they really don't believe in a resurrection, but they sing those wonderful songs, and we sing them well, whether we believe them or not. But Paul is calling us and saying, when we receive this gift of reconciliation, of having our alienation with God broken down and we become reconciled to God, we receive the gift of reconciliation in Jesus Christ, then we become ambassadors, every one of us, as followers of Jesus, no matter our station in life. We become ambassadors because you see, as I began to say, we're really good We love service. We flirt with peace, but it seems like we're allergic to evangelism. But the reconciled followers of Jesus, Paul says, have been entrusted with this message of reconciliation. And Jesus says, you don't light a candle and put a bushel basket on it. It's a message that needs to go out. It needs to go forward. It needs to be given. It needs to be shared. It needs to be witnessed to. It needs to be demonstrated. As James would say, you have your faith, show me your works. It needs to be demonstrated. We can't just do something, we need to talk about it. We just can't say, they'll see by the witness, we need to share the faith as well. It needs to be integrated together. Bearers, ambassadors, representatives of the good news of reconciliation with God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the great gift of reconciliation in Jesus Christ. Help us to be bearers, witnesses to, ambassadors of, for the sake of your kingdom and the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son, through the ages, in Jesus' name, amen.